Thank you for the introduction and uh, especially thank you for setting up this exciting seminar series in these otherwise very unusual and, and difficult times. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see the screen all right. Great, so I'm Marquita Landry. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at UC Berkeley with background in single molecule biophysics. Uh, and today I'm gonna talk about some of what my lab has been doing uh, with nanotechnology to engineer solutions for life's big problems. And I thought I'd give more of a high level overview of what we're doing with a few brief, uh, brief examples of how we use nanotechnology for life sciences applications. And so my lab is largely interested in, again, the use of nanotechnology uh, for uh, understanding more about uh, life. Uh, and the way we do this is by chemically functionalizing nanomaterials, which have unique optical and physical properties. So we like to exploit the unique optical properties of nanomaterials to make them selectively responsive for small molecules uh, that are of interest for life science applications. And specifically here, we're interested in uh, making these molecules responsive to neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, uh, where we can then implant these nanomaterials into the brain extracellular space uh, and uh, learn more about the kinetics uh, with which uh, neurons in the brain uh, communicate with each other through chemical neurotransmission. Another area of the lab that we uh, we are um, that we're working on uh, are the the use or rather the exploitation of nanomaterials' unique uh, physical properties, uh, namely their high aspect ratios, uh, very high tensile strengths, uh, and here. Uh, we're using these materials for the delivery of uh, genetic cargoes uh, to living systems. Um, and we like to uh, focus our attention here on uh, the use of their delivery for, uh, for plant systems uh, for reasons that I hope uh, throughout this talk will become clear. And so to start with, uh, with that first um, motivation of the delivery of genetic cargoes to plants, um, the genetic manipulation or genetic engineering of plants is an area that has gained uh, a lot of attention in recent years, especially because of our need to increase food production um, and to, uh, to make better use of plants for bioenergy applications. Uh, so both in agriculture and pharmaceuticals and also in bioenergy, the genetic mani manipulation of plants allows us to make crops that are more robust, um, allows us to make uh, medicinal plants uh, that are upregulated in their production of pharmaceuticals, um, and also for bioenergy applications, it allows us to genetically modify uh, plants uh, to make more efficient uh, biofuels and uh, higher uh, biomasses. All of these goals rely on our ability to deliver exogenous biomolecular cargoes, namely DNA, RNA, and protein uh, from outside the plant cell to inside the plant cell. And the work I'm going to show today is largely done by Gus de Demmer uh, and Huang Zhang in this space. Current uh, delivery techniques to plants uh, are shown here, uh, where agrobacterium-mediated delivery um, is a uh, pathogenic uh, method that takes advantage of a uh, agrobacterium, uh, which has evolved to infect certain plant species. And what we can do as scientists um, is take this agrobacterium and genetically modify it so that it carries a gene of interest um, that we are interested in delivering to the plant. Uh, this engineered agrobacterium can then deliver the gene to the plant, which then gets integrated into the plant host genome. Now, this is a very high efficiency method, but because it is a biotic method, it has a host range limitation and can only deliver DNA as a cargo. So what this means is that we're limited in our cargo type, and there are only a select number of plant species that can be infected with this agrobacterium without its further genetic manipulation. Biolistic particle delivery is a much more brute force method, uh, but much more uh, independent of plant species tissue type and cargo type. So with this method, we dehydrate our cargo, such as DNA, RNA, or protein onto the surface of gold particles, load these particles onto a gene gun, and then uh, quite literally shoot the cargo into the plant, bypassing the cell wall, the cell membrane, allowing uh, the transgene to integrate into the host genome in the case of DNA. Both of these methods um, have a lack of control over both the location and frequency of transgene integration, meaning that we get sometimes multiple insertions of the transgene copy. And for regulatory reasons, these transgenes often then have to be crossed out through laborious plant breeding uh, in order to comply with uh, genetically modified organism uh, regulations. Um, and the use of pathogens such as agrobacterium automatically elicits uh, regulatory overview as a genetically modified organism or GMO. Uh, 
So all that being said, there have been many um, successes in the production of genetically modified crops within agriculture. Here I'm listing the USDA approved genetically modified crops where the US is actually a, gro a global leader in the production of GM crops. Um, and there are many nice international examples, uh, such as the production of golden rice, which was first grown about 20 years ago. And this is a strain of rice that has had the biosynthetic pathway for vitamin A production engineered into it. And the concept here being that this could be deployed um, into uh, regions of the world with vitamin A deficiency. So despite all these successes, it still takes a very long time, on average 13 years of R&D, and at a cost of almost $146 million to produce a single GM crop. And about 40 of these $136 million are regulatory costs. So in my lab, we're interested in developing uh, methods that are both abiotic and force independent uh, in a manner that would allow us to deliver cargo such as DNA and RNA to plant species in a species independent manner, in an efficient manner, and in a way that's non-pathogenic and also non-integrating uh, to help comply with GM, the GM regulatory burden. To do so, we have to consider what our barriers are. So this takes us to the consideration of the size exclusion limit, which is a limit of how large something can be before it crosses the barrier. Now, these are very crude calculations, but if we consider the size exclusion limit of a lipid uh, membrane, for example, or the cell membrane, this is approximately 500 nanometers, and this is the dominant barrier for most cell types. However, we start looking at the size exclusion limit of the plant cell wall, which is uniquely found in plant cells, the slice exclusion limit is now 5 to 20 nanometers, and this becomes the dominant barrier that we have to consider. So we can now consider what dimensionalities of nanomaterials would best be, uh, would best be used to overcome this barrier. So we, A, have to stable those size exclusion limit, but we also need an appreciable surface area to volume ratio onto which we can do chemistry and also load by molecular cargos. So for example, zero dimension uh, carbon materials are small enough but don't have enough surface area to load cargos, whereas the extruded two-dimensional form of graphene has a very high surface area to volume ratio, but no longer has the lowest size exclusion limit. So we largely focus on these one-dimensional materials to both comply with the size exclusion limit and allow us to do chemistry on the surface to load biomolecules. So I won't go into the chemistry due to time restrictions, but the concept here is that we can load DNA plasmids or other biomolecular cargos onto the nanotube that would then traverse the cell wall, plasma membrane, and then allow the cargo to be accessed. So in the case of RNA, this would be in the cytoplasm. In the case of a plasmid, this would be in the nucleus where transcription and translation would allow us to validate whether or not the platform actually works through the production of a reporter protein such as green fluorescent protein. And so the workflow after we've chemically synthesized these constructs would be to infiltrate them onto the underside of a leaf. And again, these are carbon nanotubes that have been loaded with a GFP expressing plasmid. We can wait a few days for nanomaterial internalization to take place um, and also for the proteins to be expressed before at first pass taking the leaf tissue to a confocal microscope to assess whether or not green fluorescent protein is being expressed. And these are some of the species in which we've tested our platform. So here are some exemplary results uh, in Nicotian and benthamiana, which is tobacco, uh, arugula, wheat, and cotton, representing a variety of different tissue types uh, and morphologies where we see green fluorescent protein expression across these species. What's interesting about this platform as well is that if we look at when this green fluorescent protein is being expressed, we see a peak expression at day three, and we usually see that the expression through confocal microscopy goes back down to baseline by day 10. We can validate this at the molecular level by performing a 2PCR to quantify the amount of GFP-specific mRNA at day three and day 10, and again see a peak expression at day three with a uh, subsidence back down to uh, baseline by day 10, suggesting no DNA integration. And I won't show these results, but if we perform a digital droplet PCR assay, which has a much higher level uh, of sensitivity, we can confirm a lack of transgene integration with a level of sensitivity of about one copy per 500,000. And so with this platform um, in its integration-free uh, uh, features, what we can now do is load plasmids such, such as nucleus plasmids that code for uh, CRISPR-Cas9 systems. And the advantage here would be that we would get transient expression of Cas9 plus guide RNAs that would then be able to perform an edit on the plant host genome. 
And this edit would be heritable and would be permanent, whereas the transgene itself would not be integrated and the CRISPR system would leave no trace uh, with advantages in being able to control the location of the edit, but also uh, perhaps having advantages uh, in the regulatory uh, oversight of these genetically modified crops in the absence of transgene integration. So towards this end, my lab has started doing some preliminary experiments where we're uh, infiltrating guide RNA plasmids into Cas9 expressing plants, showing that we get expression and editing uh, roughly half as efficient as agrobacterium. Now we have to keep in mind here that agro is constitutively expressing CRISPR-Cas9 over the course of a week, which is the length of these experiments, whereas we're getting essentially a single dose with our carbon nanotube carbon nanotube constructs. So we're uh, currently exploring whether multiple doses of carbon nanotube uh, delivery of these vectors would allow us to uh, reach editing efficiencies that are on par with agrobacterium. So a question that's often asked uh, about these studies is how are these particles entering uh, the plant? Um, there are numerous studies looking at translocation across lipid membranes, but very few that are looking at transport across the plant cell wall. And so uh, a postdoc in my lab, Huan Zhang, has taken on uh, this question, and she's done so with a type of nanotechnology known as DNA nanostructure nanotechnology or DNA origami nanotechnology. And what we like about this approach is that it's much more modular than the production of uh, organic or inorganic nanoparticles and that we can very reliably and reproducibly make structures with predefined sizes, shapes, stiffnesses, compactnesses, and we can more reliably assess the, uh, the role of these features on nanoparticle transport into plant cells. And so in our lab, we've made a few different nanostructures to test the structure function relationship of internalization across the plant cell wall. Specifically, we've made uh, small tetrahedra nanoparticles using DNA nanostructure assembly methods, um, hairpin tile structures that measure five by 16 nanometers across, uh, and these hairpin tiles can be assembled into nano strings that measure five nanometers by 320 nanometers across, resembling in form factor uh, the size of a single walled carbon nanotube. And so with these structures, because they're DNA based, we can also attach cargo on these uh, red loci. Uh, here we're attaching neutralin and protein onto the tip, onto uh, 10 uh, parts of the nano string and onto the center or the side of these nanostructures as validated by AFM. And so to test, for example, the size dependence of our nanostructure, we can use a transgenic GFP expressing plant uh, here uh, known as MGFP5 benthamiana or tobacco. Now what you're seeing here is actually the cytosol of the plant cell that's lighting up in green. And the reason that it looks like this jigsaw shape is because the plant cell has a very large central vacuole that pushes the cytosol to the side. So it's important to use something like an endogenous GFP marker to be able to know where the cytosol is in these plants. We can also tag our nanostructures with a Psi3 die, and this will tell us where the location or the final destination is of our nanostructure post infiltration into the plant leaf tissue. And then by doing an overlay or co-localization analysis, we can get a relative quantification uh, of the relative internalization propensities of these nanostructures. So for example, if we tag our nanostructures uh, with a Psi3 dye, where these tetrahedra particles measure between 2.4 and 12.6 nanometers, and then calculate the co-localization fraction, we see that as a function of size, the co-localization fraction decreases, suggesting that the smaller tetrahedra internalize more than the larger ones as we would expect. We can then repeat this assay for nanostructure shape, where our hypothesis here is that the nanostring, which is most similar in form factor to carbon nanotubes, would internalize best. However, what we see is that these nanostrings actually internalize uh, the least as assessed by our co-localization fraction. And this left us a little perplexed, again, given the similarities in uh, the shape between the nanostring and the single wall carbon nanotube, which worked so well for our gene delivery applications. And so the next experiment that we did was to take a Psi3 tagged nanostring and quite simply tether it or link it to a single walled carbon nanotube and ask, does the whole structure internalize or not? So this structure is inherently larger than either one by itself. Um, and when we repeat the assay where co-localization again uh, is a proxy for internalization, 
we see that nanostrings don't internalize by themselves very well. Carbon nanotubes uh, or single wall carbon nanotubes uh, do internalize quite well. And the conjugate single wall carbon nanotubes plus nanostrings internalize just as much as single wall carbon nanotubes. Now, the main difference between the nanostring and the carbon nanotube is a several order of magnitude difference in their tensile strength. So what these results suggest is that uh, in addition to size, the stiffness of the particle also has a fairly big role in its ability to translocate across the plant cell wall. Lastly, we can take these nanostructures, put siRNA on them, and then deliver them to the tissue of these GFP expressing plants. And here we can target GFP for downregulation uh, to test and see if these nanostructures would allow us to do uh, gene silencing in plants in a DNA-free manner. And so by infiltrating these nanostructures into plants, we can start looking at how well they silence the endogenously expressed GFP, where the relative fluorescence intensity tracks with the uh, efficiency of the knockdown or knock, uh, knockdown, where the TH uh, or hairpin tiles, tetrapods, um, silence quite well, and double-stranded RNA and nanostrings by itself do not. We can also validate this at the level of uh, protein expression where we can extract green fluorescent protein from the plant tissue, perform a Western blot, uh, and make sure that the quantification matches what we see in confocal microscopy. And I'm not showing this here, but we can also show that the GFP levels endogenously resume back to baseline seven days post infiltration as we would expect for transient silencing. Now what's interesting here is that if we repeat, so I'm here, I'm just showing the data again uh, from our Western blot where we're looking at relative GFP amount as a function of nanostructure. What we would expect is if we do a qPCR to measure the mRNA amount, that the qPCRs would also track with the amount of protein except in the negative form in terms of downregulation. However, if we look at the GFP mRNA fold change, we see that this uh, only holds for free siRNA that's delivered and siRNA that's delivered on the vertex of a tetrapod, where we get the canonical decrease in GFP mRNA, which tracks with the relative decrease in GFP amount. What's interesting is that we get an upregulation of GFP-specific mRNA with siRNA delivered by the nanostring or by the hairpin tiles. Now, the main difference between these structures is in the steric accessibility of the siRNA where the siRNA that's free or on the vertex of the tetrapod um, is much more sterically accessible than those that are attached to the sides or the center of these other nanostructures. So our current hypothesis is that for sterically accessible siRNAs, uh, we undergo a, a canonical transcriptional gene silencing uh, that involves cleavage of the GFP-specific mRNA uh, through recruitment of the risk protein pathway. However, um, with a sterically inaccessible siRNA, uh, we undergo post-transcriptional gene silencing mechanisms that are perhaps non-canonical uh, and still allow protein level uh, decreases in expression of GFP, uh, but without, uh, without um, uh, through translational rep uh, repression where the mRNA is left intact. Now to close off the talk by uh, giving you a sense of how we can exploit not the unique physical properties of nanomaterials, but the unique optical properties of nanomaterials, uh, just a few brief notes of how we use these materials as optical recorders uh, of brain chemistry. Now brain chemistry is an element of neuroscience that has uh, remained elusive for quite some time because while there are great analytical chemistry methods and microscopy methods to uh, study the brain structure and connectivity, so the, the way that neurons are arranged in the brain, and their electrical activity or the action potentials by which neurons um, signal their activity, there's been limited advances in abilities to measure chemical activity, which is essentially the language that neurons use to communicate with each other after they're becoming electrically active through action potentials. So this has been a missing dimension in neurobiology where modulatory neurotransmitters such as dopamine um, have had uh, a limited ability to be assessed in their uh, relevant spatial and temporal kinetics. And so the platform um, that we exploit here is the unique optical properties of nanomaterials. So again, using single-walled car carbon nanotubes, specifically the semiconducting variety, we see that these materials are excitonic in nature, which means that they have a band gap through which excitons can recombine, and the energy of that band gap is going to be proportional to the energy of the photon that is emitted, allowing us to, as a function of chirality, uh, get near-infrared photons uh, that are going to be representative of uh, 
uh, the intensity of each of these materials as a function of their semiconducting band gaps. Now, what's interesting about this fluorescence intensity is that it is uh, very sensitive to the local dielectric environment of the nanoparticles, such that if we take a polymer that can adsorb onto the surface of the nanotube, the polymer now serves as a type of um, molecular uh, bodyguard, if you will, uh, to modulate what types of molecules are going to cause perturbations in the exciton recombination rate, which is proportional to the intensity of the material. And so, for example, uh, we can make a library of these uh, nanomaterials, each conjugated with different polymers, um, and then uh, screen these polymer uh, carbon nanotube conjugates to see which ones are going to be selectively optically active to analytes of interest. Um, and a former graduate student in my lab, Abraham Beyene, took on this project to use this platform uh, to develop a dopamine nanosensor. Um, Mark Kito, you have three minutes. Sounds good, thank you. So with this nanosensor, we can then implant it into the brain extracellular space of coronal slices uh, originating from mice, and then use infrared imaging uh, to image the release of chemical neurotransmitters into the brain extracellular space. So what you're seeing here are the nanosensors implanted into the brain ECFs with varying amplitudes of electrical stimulation that unsurprisingly uh, scale uh, in intensity of dopamine release with magnitude of electrical stimulation. Now, what's interesting about this platform is because the molecular recognition is synthetic, um, it is compatible with pharmacology. So what we're using uh, this platform for now is the study of addiction, um, and we're uh, doing so uh, in a way that allows us to use um, pharmacology to probe how these drugs are affecting uh, the brain's ability to communicate. So for example, dopamine receptor agonists and antagonists, which will either increase or decrease synaptic dopamine levels. So for example, if we add quinprol to our brain tissue slices and measure the average response of dopamine released, we see that in artificial cerebral spinal fluid, we get the typical response. With quinprol, we see a decrease in dopamine release. If we wash the drug out, we get a recovery in our signal. Now, true to kind of single bio molecule biophysics form, um, biological systems are inherently heterogeneous. And so instead of averaging over our entire field of view, the advantage of an optical platform is that it allows us to, uh, to query what these individual dopamine hotspots are doing. So instead of analyzing our data by averaging over the entire signal, if we now ask what each of these dopamine release hotspots are doing and plot those as a function of, for example, change in fluorescence ratio, what we expect is that with the addition of a drug like Quinprol, these hotspots would, as the average suggests, decrease dopamine release. And we see that for most of these hotspots, that is indeed the case. So we get a change in fluorescence that's uh, in ratio form less than one. However, we see a significant number of hotspots that actually have the opposite response predicted by this drug, say an increase in their response, uh, despite the fact that this is a dopamine receptor agonist. And so what these data uh, suggest um, and motivate are further inquiries into the endogenous variabilities for how neurons and dopamine release sites are uh, changing with respect to drugs, um, highlighting the specific point that they might not all have the same response um, as has been measured through bulk analytical techniques in the past. So our future directions uh, in this scope, again, are going to be to further um, look into the, the basis of biological heterogeneity for uh, responses to drugs in the brain. Uh, we're also interested in developing uh, infrared imaging techniques that would allow through skull imaging, uh, enabling us to do these studies in vivo uh, in awake and behaving animals, uh, and also uh, query uh, through animal models of disease, such as Parkinson's and Huntington's disease, how these disease states are influencing uh, dopamine signaling in the brain. So with that, um, I would like to greatly thank my lab, uh, who has uh, pioneered uh, the bulk of this work, um, specifically, again, Huang Zhang, who uh, developed the DNA nanostructure uh, work, uh, Desda Demmer, who developed uh, the DNA delivery work for plants, uh, and Abraham Beyene, uh, who developed our dopamine probe. I would also like to make a, a brief shout out to both of these investigators uh, who are starting their own labs, uh, either recently in the case of Abraham or in the coming years, uh, Gazda Demmer. Uh, if you're a trainee in the audience and you're interested in this line of work, I highly recommend you reaching out to either Abraham or Gazda uh, for opportunities in their own research groups um, and to get involved in uh, these exciting areas of research. 
So thank you all for your attention and, and glad to entertain any questions. Thanks, Marquita, for a great talk. And um, so there's quite a few questions, um, but uh, I'll start with uh, Itai Cohen uh, first asked um, how the nanotube, why the nanotubes are so good at getting into the cells. And, but then you started to uh, talk about uh, the different DNA origami and he followed up by saying that he didn't, uh, he wasn't thinking about geometry so much, but was wondering about the hydrophobicity. Um. Yeah, the, the, the hydrophobicity is not something that we've uh, tuned uh, as a parameter to look at how that affects internalization. But of course, uh, these are going to be uh, water soluble constructs, uh, whether they're being used in plants or in brains, uh, just because of biocompatibility reasons. So in all cases, uh, the water compatibility or hydrophobicity is conferred by, the col uh, by either the polymer on the surface or by the chemistry that's done on the surface. Um, and so for, for our constructs that we use, they're all going to be uh, hydrophilic, but to the extent that there are degrees of hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity, we have not tested that as a parameter. Uh, uh, Shri once asked uh, if the nanotubes were completely degraded after, uh, like in the um, plant cells after they released their cargo. Not at all, and we're not even sure that they're releasing their cargo in the first place. Um, so these nanotubes are, are small in their diameter, one nanometer, so about the size of a molecule of water. So the cargo's on the outside and plasmids are, are larger than the width, uh, or rather than the diameter of the nanotube. So it's possible that transcription could happen without desorption. Um, with regards to their degradation, they are not degraded. Um, I would not um, intend for these nanomaterials to be used in the field, for example, um, where they couldn't be recovered. Uh, but for some of our CRISPR applications, their applications to, for example, embryonic tissue, plant cell callus, um, where we would expose the tissue uh, to the nanomaterial, but then regenerate plants a few generations later, uh, that would be um, devoid of, of direct exposure to the nanomaterial is where I foresee those applications being most impactful. Um, Christoph Schmidt asked again about the uh, entry into the cell and asked if the import mechanism uh, involves active import machinery. That's a great question. And the answer so far uh, from some preliminary studies seems that it depends on the shape. So if we take a nanosphere um, and deliver it to plants, it seems to be energy independent. Whereas if we use endocytosis inhibitors and try to deliver carbon nanotubes or other high aspect ratio materials, not just carbon based, it seems to be energy dependent, um, which is an interesting result that we're looking into. Um, and uh, I, I just lost, uh, uh, Rudra Biswas asked if the mass of the nanotube modifies the dopamine transport across the synapse. Uh, by a physiologically significant amount? That's a great question. So the, the relative spatial and temporal kinetics are micron and second to slightly sub-second for uh, neuromodulation, which is much faster, uh, or sorry, much slower than classical neurotransmission. Um, our uh, both in vitro experiments and molecular dynamic simulations uh, suggest that the uh, chelation or adsorption of dopamine on the carbon nanotube is on the order of several hundred nanoseconds. Um, so that's the MD result and um, doesn't seem to affect the endogenous uh, signaling um, that we've otherwise validated with fast scan cyclic voltometry. 